Okay, let's do the thyroid. This should be pretty straightforward. So we'll do low thyroid function first, where the symptoms are pretty obvious for the most part. People who are gaining weight, fatigued, constipated, cold even. And then I like to remember that they have hair loss and nail changes a lot of the time. That coarse hair is also something that they'll talk about. On the exam and a question, I've been tripped up before because they'll, we know that they, you know, we've all heard they have delayed D, you know, like DTRs, reflexes, but one thing that they've gotten me with before is they do the the reflex check and they describe the tendon sort of balling up or this thick mass that develops when you hit the knee uh, reflex. And it's confusing, but what they're really describing is just a, del a delayed relaxation of the deep tendon reflex. So don't let that sort of thing confuse you. And they do that a lot of times on the shelf with other things. They they take things that you would otherwise know if you saw the word and they describe it in greater description so that you just can't knee jerk and pick, oh yeah, uh, I, I remember that from this disorder and get the answer right. Uh, other things with hypothyroidism uh, that are not super obvious, maybe like hyponatremia. Uh, for whatever reason, this uh, low thyroid hormone makes you not clear water as well. It can lower your sodium. And uh, they can also get mixed edema. And remember that that's a cause of carpal tunnel syndrome. And be careful not to knee jerk and pick, you know, splinting or another intervention for carpal tunnel syndrome that you'd otherwise normally pick. Because if they have carpal tunnel syndrome because of hypothyroidism, we can actually fix it by giving them horm hormone replacement. So uh, that's something to be aware of. Always read those questions carefully. And other metabolic abnormalities, you probably already remember those, but increased cholesterol, just be aware of that. And a macrocytic anemia. So if someone has an MCV of you know 95 or 100, you're probably thinking, oh, that's a folate deficiency. Uh, but look at the thyroid hormone level. And if their TSH is elevated, then you might have a good reason that they have a macrocytic anemia that's not a folate or B12 deficiency. So when you think about the causes, the when you think, you know, the thyroid itself, Hashimoto's disease is by far the most common cause. In fact, they don't even recommend drawing the antibody levels for the anti-TPO uh, lab results. They, they, you don't even need to if you have a diffusely enlarged gland and signs of hypothyroidism. It's just an automatic diagnosis almost. But just, just so we're all clear, make sure you understand high TSH suggests that you have a problem inside the thyroid itself or a primary hypothyroidism. And, and the other thing is I don't want you to get tripped up and miss that Sometimes if you read the question carefully, the patient has a history of a lymphoma and they got neck radiation, or maybe they had Graves' disease and received radioactive iodine ablation that knocked out the whole thyroid, or they've had a surgery to remove the thyroid, uh, or if they've been on amiodarone therapy. All these things could cause hypothyroidism and they're not Hashimoto's. So you just got to be aware of your differential you know, possibilities and not just knee-jerk into Hashimoto's. Uh, and then... Somebody who has, you know, thyroiditis after a viral infection, usually they have pretty specific symptoms like painful enlargement, fever, and transient hyperthyroidism beforehand, but they can ultimately have a period of hypothyroidism sort of in the period afterwards. Then if you're talking about central hypothyroidism, then you're probably thinking about a pituitary adenoma that's just non-functional so that there's low TSH, subsequently low thyroid hormone release. And I mentioned the other causes here in the adrenal gland lecture, and I recommend you look over that because apoplexy and shihans or other pituitary things you could definitely see on your shelf. And all patients that were thinking about hypothyroidism and they need a, a TSH, and if that's abnormal, we'd measure the free T4, and then we're going to get a good idea um, if it's primary or uh, central. Uh, so uh, when we talk about increased thyroid hormone release, scintigraphy or radioactive uptake studies are a really big thing with hyperthyroidism. However, for hypothyroidism, they're not really useful and we don't do it at all, in fact. Uh, and then just another word about Hashimoto's, let's just go through it really quickly here. They have antibodies against uh, thyroid peroxidase or thyroid globulin, uh, and uh, that's great, but it's really not something you're going to, that'll probably just be in the question stem for you. The classic exam finding is a diffusely enlarged but non-tender thyroid. Uh, and this can happen at any point in, in someone's life. 
but be aware that the initial presentation could actually be with symptoms of hyperthyroidism because initially there may be some lysis and destruction of the thyroid cells with transient increased thyroid hormone levels. Uh, but that should be followed long term by persistent hypothyroidism. Uh, and you should know that long term they have a risk for lymphoma and the, that's actually a presentation you might see on the shelf. Somebody who is positive for TPO antibodies, they've had hypothyroidism for years and they present with this new neck mass or nodule and it's been rapidly growing, then I'd say the best answer for that patient is actually a lymphoma. And kind of went through this already, so I'm not going to dig into it too much here. We just about radiation or ablation for graves is something that could, you know, cause hypothyroidism later on. But one thing I want to briefly touch on here is amiodarone therapy. And if you happen to have a case where they were trying to, you know, suggest to you that the patient was having hypothyroidism as a result of that, then the clue is that actually uh, amiodarone blocks, blocks conversion of T4 to T3. So the patients would have really low T3 levels with normal T4. So keep that pearl in your head and maybe you'll get a point out of it. And I wanted to cover Dacorvain's thyroiditis or transient post-viral thyroiditis really quickly because I think it's a, a very commonly tested uh, diagnosis. And the key is, is just, it's just so obvious. You have a diffusely enlarged and tender thyroid gland and they usually have a fever. And this typically is one to two weeks after they had another maybe viral URI. And they may have symptoms of hyperthyroidism, you know, tremor, anxiety, palpitations. And if they do, the best answer is to give them a beta blocker. But their thyroidism, they're going to have increased uh, hormone release because of the breakdown, probably from the virus. But then ultimately, they're going to regain function on their own. And we do not give them levothyroxine. Okay, so if the, if the question says, should you give them horn, hormone replacement or not, you'd say no. And the best answer long term is they should follow up in a few months and have their level rechecked. And then this is a great example of a shelf question where they just give you something and you're like, you know, what the hell is that? Somebody who's got one side of their neck and it's painful and it's, an, you know, sounds like it's a thyroid thing, but it's, they don't have necessarily symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Uh, but this is a, a case where you might have a, an acute infection of the thyroid gland with an abscess. It's obviously going to be a staph aureus abscess because when is it not? Um, and the key here would be they give you an ultrasound that shows this solid cystic component along with a fever, which suggests an abscess. And let's say they want to tell you, you know, have you answer, how do you manage this? The best thing to do would be to order a fine needle aspiration in order to get a gram stain into culture to see if you can grow bacteria. And then obviously you're going to want to do antibiotics, probably something that covers staph aureus like vancomycin. But the best treatment option is going to be percutaneous drainage where you, you know, IR comes in and puts a needle in and a tube and basically the person has to sit around for a week or so probably with a, a drain out of their neck. Now we'll do hyperthyroidism and the exact opposite of hyperthyroidism. I think we're all familiar with it. Palpitations, anxiety, weight loss, heat, AFib, uh, and the most common cause, by far and large, is Graves' disease. And it is associated with those antibodies that can actually stimulate the thyroid receptor instead of inhibiting it. Uh, but I want you to know that those antibodies are not super sensitive, and in a lot of cases of Graves' disease, they may not be positive for the antibody. So let's evaluate somebody. They've got a low TSH because it's suppressed and elevated thyroid hormone levels. And then now the best next step is to do uh, radioactive scintigraphy, which we didn't do for hypothyroidism. But this is going to be helpful to us now in evaluating what the cause of their hyperthyroidism is. And if it's diffusely increased, diffusely increased uptake on scintigraphy, I don't care what else they told you. I don't care if the antibody levels are positive or not, or if they have eye problems. The answer is Graves' disease. Okay, get that in your head. That is how you diagnose Graves' disease. That is pathognomonic. Uh, and then toxic adenomas would have focal uptake, that's fairly straightforward. And then multinodular goiters would have multiple areas, but then the other areas that are not part of the, each goiter have low uptake. Um, and then let's say you had somebody who has symptoms of hyperthyroidism and a low TSH, uh, uh, but you think maybe they're abusing the drug. 
then you might draw a thyroglobulin level. Uh, but whoopsie daisy, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, somebody can have low uptake on scintigraphy if they're abusing thyroid hormone, or they have post-viral thyroiditis, like we talked about previously. So real quick with Graves disease, anybody who has hyperthyroidism and eye symptoms, that's what the cause is going to be. It is autoimmune, and uh, with the optim, uh, optal, I cannot say that word. With the eye issues, uh, what we're thinking about here is. For whatever reason, they activate receptors in the orbital region. They cause enlargement of the, the tissues behind the eye in the orbit. And, and they can actually cause entrapment of the extraocular muscles uh, and, and proptosis. Um, but remember that, well, I'll do that in a second, actually. So, and I already went over this with you, diffusely increased uptake. Uh, now we'll talk about the, the eye issues, okay? So it's swelling and fluid accumulation. And if you did an imaging exam, they tell you from the imaging that they had lots of swelling and fluid, but not necessarily inflammation. And proptosis is a key finding, but they can also have what appears to be an extraocular muscle uh, nerve palsy when it's really just there's so much swelling that the muscles are trapped. Uh, and I wanted to remind you that with general hyperthyroidism from any cause, not just Graves' disease, you could have you know bug eyes and lid lag just like if you drank a bunch of coffee, but that does not mean you have Graves' ophthalmopathy. Uh, so the key to differentiating that would be noticing the proptosis or the entrapment of the muscles and increased swelling. Uh, and a definite pearl you want to be aware of is that somebody who's got Graves' eye issues, you do not want to give them a radioiodine ablation, which is a curative therapy. It can completely just knock out all the thyroid tissue and cure the disease, but if they have ophthalmopathy, it can worsen the symptoms, so don't do that. And unfortunately, it sounds like from what everything I've read that nothing really helps Graves' eye issues. They're just sort of stuck with it. It's just a bummer. So uh, supportive treatment is the answer if they ask you about that, but they probably will not. How do we treat Gra Graves' disease? So the symptoms from too much thyroid hormone, as with any cause, we treat with propranolol or a nonspecific beta blocker. And then for the thyroid issues itself, we have to control it initially with either methimazole or propylthiouracil. And uh, the only time that you're going to use PTU is if the patient is pregnant, uh, because uh, methimazole is the better drug with less complications, and it is not allowed to be used in early pregnancy. So actually, the way this works is that during the first trimester of pregnancy, you have to take PTU, and then the ne the next two trimesters these patients can actually take methimazole. So before we can actually give either of these medicines, we have to do a CBC and liver function testing because of the risk for necrosis of the liver with both of these drugs. But the key is that if the neutrophil count is less than 500, we can't give methimazole. And remember that if a patient is on one of these medicines and they present with an acute fever, sore throat, um, or a signs of sepsis, you want to immediately withdraw these medicines because you think that they're a cause of maybe a granulocytosis. Um, then after we've stabilized them with medical management, we can do a permanent treatment, which could either be taking the thyroid gland out altogether or radioiodine ablation. But remember, we do not do that for people who have eye problems.